for it is not permitted for them to speak, but are to subject themselves, just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in the church. Wow, what am I doing here today? I'm actually speaking in Ecclesia, right? You are the congregation and I'm speaking, I'm totally breaking this commandment here. How many women are familiar with the scripture? Right, and, and how many women were told by pastors that this is, these are the, the words of Apostle Paul and that this particular prohibition binds women, uh, I mean, prohibits them to be pastors or teachers? Yes, yes. Okay, I'm very familiar with that as well because my background is from Watchtower Society. I. I, I was actually brought up as a Jehovah's Witness. I had a Jehovah's Witness mother who, who taught me this religion. And um, I only came out to Jesus Christ in a very miraculous way five years ago. So, same And in Watchtower Society, they teach women that they cannot, uh, they cannot uh, lead even in a prayer. They cannot pray aloud when men are present. And if they do, they have to cover their heads to show that they are actually subjected to a male and they are performing a duty that was not really assigned to a woman to do. So I come from that background. Despite this Bible verse that I just read to you, what if I told you that even in the Old Testament, that was extremely patriarchal, Old Testament reveals us stories of women of God who rise down to their calling, even to a leadership position. Most of the time in churches, you will hear entire sermons on wonderful men of God. Abraham, Moses, Joseph, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Apostle Paul, and so on. And rightfully so, because these were the great men of God that God used in a mighty way, amen? But rarely, if ever, the pastors dig out the stories of women who were also used by God of Israel in a mighty way. What if I told you that God used a woman to direct a king and a priest of Israel in a way of the Lord? That God used a woman to lead the entire nation of Israel and this particular woman was able to take the whole nation away from their idolatry and sin and bring it to a favorable position with God. And what if I told you that God used a woman to save the entire Hebrew race from total annihilation? In the Bible, I will, I will tell you a little bit about these three women and then we will come back to the Corinthian scripture, okay? In the Bible, in a book of 2 Kings, we are informed that paganism swept over Israel for over 50 years. When Josiah became king, he was a godly king. He wanted to undo the wickedness done by previous kings. The priests in Israel stumbled upon the book of the law hidden in the temple. Now it is believed by Jewish sages today that this particular book was a book of Deuteronomy. The people of Israel had forgotten God's law and they turned to other gods. The previous wicked kings practiced idolatry, witchcraft, prostitution in the temple, and even sacrificing of humans. When the word of Deuteronomy were, written, uh, were read aloud to King Josiah, he tore his clothes he wept and he repented. Josiah sent the high priest called Hilka after a prophet, a woman who was a contemporary of Jeremiah. In fact, uh, her name was Huda, and she was a cousin of Jeremiah. Notice that Josiah said uh, what, what Josiah said for Hilka to do. In 2 Kings 22 13, we read. 
go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for Judah about what is written in this book that has been found. So the high priest goes to Huda, the prophetess. But why to Huda? There was Jeremiah. He could have easily go to Jeremiah. Well, Huda was very faithful in a sinful, idolatrous society. She was chosen by God to speak for him. She was able to interpret the words in a book and give a prophetic message to the high priest for the king Josiah. So they took a book of the law. They took it to a woman, Huda, right? And she interpreted the Torah to the king and to the high priest. In fact, I will read you this uh, prophetic message from 2 Kings chapter 22, 18 and 19. Tell the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord. This is what the Lord God of Israel says concerning the words you heard. Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken against this place and its people that they would become accursed and laid waste and become, uh, and, and you, because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I heard you, declares the Lord. So what did you see here? When a great authority such as king and men as of spiritual authority such as Luca, he was a high priest, are seeking direction from a woman, Right? It was approved by God as, as, as a prophetess. Let's go to the other woman. About 3,000 years ago in Israel lived a woman named Deborah. The period in which she lived is known as the period of judges. And Deborah was a woman chosen by God himself to serve as the judge of Israel. It was at a time when Jewish people were not united on the king and the 12 tribes uh, lived pretty much independently. Now, at the time of Deborah, the people abandoned the ways and laws of Torah, and they followed the example of their heaven neighbors. They had a cruel Canaanite king, Yabin, oppressed, who oppressed the Jews. The king had a general called Sisera, and Sisera made lives of Jewish people almost unbearable. So when Jews couldn't stand this situation any longer, they pleaded with God. And he said, please send us somebody to deliver us from this situation. So God heard their cry. And what did he do? What did he send? Well, he sends a leader, military leader, prophetess, called Deborah. Deborah remained loyal to God and to Torah, even among the sinful generation. She directed Barak to summon the Jewish army and lead victory against Canaanites. Now, Barak agreed to accept the grass plan, but under one condition. Do you know what the condition was? Right, he didn't want to go alone. He said, well, I will do it, but not without you. You must come with me to the battle. Why? Because I know that the Lord is with you. So here is the Deborah, she ended up actually going to actual physical battle with Barak and the Jewish army, right? Now Sisera had a very mighty army and, and much better equipped than Jewish people. He had iron chariots and they're likened to a tanks today. Like imagine army with these more sophisticated tanks against army who didn't have chariots, right? Do you know what Lord did? And in the beginning, the Sisera was winning this battle, but then Lord took over. All he had to do, he just poured the rain down, which created mud, and Sisera's iron chariots got stuck in the mud, and they couldn't move anymore, right? So the Jewish army took over, and Sisera saw that, oh, well, I am going to lose this battle, so he started running. And as he was running, the Sisera's army lost the commander, and they were confused. And now Israelite army pursued them, and not even one 
of Caesar's menace in this case, they all died. However, Lord directed Caesarea to flee to the tent of Yael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. This woman is, uh, used her diplomacy, right? She gave Caesarea to eat and drink, and she was very kind to him. And Caesarea was extremely tired from this long battle, so he fell asleep. So what did Yael do? Yael took a tent peg, and a hammer and draw the peg into his temple. So she caused the head wound, right? And he died. <laughs> so we see that God in this story used not one woman, but two women to do the job, right? Okay. Okay, so what happened after that? Deborah was reigning as a ruler judge was basically having authority of the president today. She was a ruler of Israel for 40 years. And uh, she brought Israel from a very bad condition, spiritually and physically, to a very favorable condition uh, before the Lord. And uh, it was a very peaceful reign. Israel had really good time during her reign. Okay, and now the last woman that I want to share with you, uh, there are many women, see, I mean, there's so many more, I just don't have time to talk to you about each one. But the one I picked as the last is Esther, she's my really favorite one. Esther's story is not from the land of Israel, it is from the diaspora, where Jews encountered the worst form of anti-Semitism, and they were actually facing complete annihilation. And why? Because the king, Ahasuerus, allowed Haman to make a decision over the Jew Jewish people's destiny. And Ahasuerus wasn't even aware of the fact that his wife, Esther, was a Jewish woman. Esther was not her real name. I think her real name was Hadassah. And uh, that was her Jewish name. The, the name Esther means hidden. She was a hidden Jewish woman. Okay, and Hadassah means myrtle, like a myrtle tree, and if you ever do research on myrtle tree, uh, myrtle tree has no aroma, the leaves have no aroma, unless they're crushed. Once you crush them, they release this strength and aroma, right? So here we go, Lord has raised a woman, Mordecai said to her, who knows if you came to palace for such a time as this? And what did uh, Esther do when she was crushed for her people, when she wanted Hama want to kill off Jewish race? She told Mordecai, I want you and the entire Hebrew nation to fast for three days. You shall not eat, you shall not drink, and I won't eat nor drink either, and no, nor will my maidens. Okay, my, my servants, but we are going to supplicate the Lord and going to repent and ask the Lord to help us in this situation. Then she had to go face the king. Now that was a really difficult task because the king was like God on earth. And you know, her husband was not a godly king. He was not a godly king. And uh, nobody could go in his presence without the fact that he actually called on them. And that included his wife, Esther, right? But she was willing to lose her life. She said to Mordecai, if I perish, then I perish. See, she was the myrtle tree. She was crushed for her people. And otherwise, kind of a passive, subjecting woman, very humble woman. When she was crushed for her people, she released the aroma of bravery. And now she was brave and willing to even lose her own life for her people. Does that remind you of somebody who was willing to die for the people? Well, Esther sure was willing to die for Jewish people. But we know the ending of the story, don't we? Yes, her, it all ended uh, very well and in victory and her husband has uh, accepted uh, her, and uh, we all know what happens, and we have this uh, festival in uh, uh, Israel today called Purim, 
which that's a festival of extra, and it's nothing like joy and celebration and a lot of food, and those are dressed as princesses, and each one wants to be a princess, uh, Esther, Queen Esther. I want to summarize all this for you all been here. Huda seemed to be the only woman in that nation who knew the words of the law. She knew how to interpret the words, right? And she had the words of God upon her mouth. God used her, and she was the only one in that nation at the time. Deborah, she was a ruler, political ruler, military leader, and religious leader. And she was chosen by God himself. Esther, she was somewhat clever, witty, she was beautiful in body, very humble, but at a time of danger, very decisive, very wise and brave and diplomatic, willing to die for entire nation. Now, let's compare these actions of these women with the Corinthians. Chapter 4, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35. I have a question. Do you think that these women were aware of a law in a Torah that prohibited, prohibited them to speak in an assembly? I mean, let's read these Corinthians again, okay? It says, let your women be silent in the church. Actually, it says in assembly or in congregation, for it is not permitted for them to speak, but they are to subject themselves just as the law says. What law? Well, if there is such a law, would God ever choose a woman to speak for him, to lead the nation of Israel, and go against his own law? Would he do it? Okay. If you go to Torah, to entire 613 laws they had, you will not find one law, not one, that prohibits women to speak in the assembly. Not one. Nowhere you will find in the Torah that women are to go to their husbands to ask them at home because they cannot have questions in a church or speak because their voice is ashamed. So I was kind of perplexed because, you know, after I came out of Watchtower, I wanted to know everything. I mean, everything about Jesus. But then I wanted to know how much can I speak as a woman. And as I was reading Corinthians, I was like, where is that law? I want that law. I mean, he said, as the law says, the Paul is quoting law. And I couldn't find the law. So as I was doing research, I found that there is such a law. Can it be put up there? Yeah, here we go. The law is in the Talmud. It's in the oral law of Jews. That law is made by men for men. Okay, it says, it is a shame for a woman to let her voice be heard among men. And there is more, more of the Talmud. A woman's voice is prohibited because it is sexually provocative, okay? And there was one more? I think it was three prohibitions on female voice. Oh, the voice of a woman is filthy nakedness. Okay. Well, then I learned, I was doing a digging in a research of Greek scripture original. Well, the, the Greek manuscripts, you know, we have a uh, New Testament from the Greek manuscript, so I was digging into that, and I found, when I was looking at the original, that these 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35, were not Paul's words at all. They were not. These two verses that were found on the margin, on the bottom, you see the bottom there, the margin? Okay, this was, Paul was actually writing down on the margin what these people were saying to him, what they were asking him about. And then later on, it was put in the regular text, okay, as if it was 
the, the words of Paul, uh, these were words of Paul, but then notice how Paul actually answered this quotation. He answers these people, these Judaizers, the Pharisees. Okay, he tells them, what? Look at the verse 36. He says, what? Came the word of God out of you? Or came it unto you only? He's actually challenging this Talmud. He's challenging Talmudic teaching. He says, what? The word, I just told you, God used women prophets. The word of God came also out of the mouth of a woman, not only men. So Paul was actually challenging them, right? And then he continues, if any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that he that the things that uh, I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord, but if any man be ignorant, let him stay that way. So if they want to be ignorant, they want to teach Talmud in the Christian church, let him stay that way. But it is our job, ladies, to dig this truth out for ourselves, right? In the Institute of Biblical Research, we believe in biblical equality. We believe that God has created male and female on his own image, that he created them equal. They are equally fallen, and they are equally redeemed, hallelujah, by our Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He has died on the cross. He has reconciled us back to God. And when God created a woman, he created her to be ruler over the creation with a man, next to a man. He said, let them rule, not let him rule, but let them rule and have a dominion have a dominion over who? Each other? Have a dominion over the earth and the fish of the sea and the beast in the land and the creation, but not over each other, right? So this is what our Jesus did for us on the cross, ladies. He, he brought us back to the beginning. He gave us the dignity back. And here we have Paul, many times he's misinterpreted. People say, oh, Paul said that it's a shame for a woman to speak, but Paul never, never said that. So I want to leave you with um, one scripture, and it's Galatians 3.28. These are the words of Paul. He did say those words. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you all are one in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Yes. So I want to invite you, ladies, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to ignore you, my Christian brothers, I do love you, but, <laughs> but I think you can learn from my speech as well. But I want to encourage you, sisters, that if you feel that you have a call on your life, that God is nudging you, Holy Spirit is telling you something, and you're afraid that, oh, I can't come up to this position because I'm a woman, I want to free you from this. I want you to come and rise to the calling that you have in God because we are all ambassadors for Jesus Christ. So I hope this message blessed you and I want to wish you shalom and I want to call upon God to bless this great country, the United States of America. And please pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Amen.